Good morning, everybody. Uh, to start off, I thought what I wanted to do this morning was show you a little bit of what we do to actually get a church service recorded. So I'm going to give you a quick tour of our lounge and, and what we do to, to get a recording done each Sunday. So each Saturday night, we have to set up our lounge with everything that's needed to get a service recorded. So you can see the chair that I normally sit in. And uh, today I have a problem because a, a certain Miss Mama Mia has decided that she's going to occupy that. So she'll unfortunately be bumped for a little bit. Uh, and here's the music stand that holds my sermon notes, but it also holds the camera. So we've put a camera in place at the moment. And if I were to sit there, you can see that's how it picks me up. We have to have some lights just to make sure that there's enough light because during the daytime there's too much noise in the complex and so we uh, record in the evenings but that requires setting up a whole bunch of lights uh, to create sufficient light uh, and so there's one that we've put it on the roof and one that goes behind so that the the backdrop can be properly lit up Jedediah uh, and he always comes and takes up his position automatically the moment the music stand gets put into place. Jedediah chooses his spot straight away. And so that's what's involved in, in getting a service recorded. And we just thought that you would like to see that happening. Uh, and if I turn around over here, here's our kitchen table and the communion setup as well. And over here on this side, just the lights again, the rest of our lounge and the recording studio. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little tour of, of how we do our recordings um, and a, a huge big thank you to Brenda and Caleb who often do the work of helping me set up our little studio um, and that's just so that I can say from our home to yours, good morning and God bless you as we worship together. Just before we begin our time of worship together, I want to remind you of the Global Leadership Summit, and here's a quick video to introduce that. As leaders, in order to have growth, we must be able to endure a little bit of chaos. It comes down to do we listen to the know or do we listen to the knowing? We are defined by how we treat each other. Remember the Lord saying, how can you sit here and do nothing? Every executive in every country, everywhere, is talking about the return to the office, the next normal. The answer lives inside you. This may cause you to fear, but you cannot quit. But that kind of social risk-taking is what leaders have to do. Don't you dare quit! Don't you dare give up! And so I really want to encourage you to come along to the Global Leadership Summit. It'll be online and it really is a very meaningful experience. It's something that will inspire and equip you. And I do hope that you will join in. This month is the Uniting Presbyterian Church in Southern Africa's Month of Mission. And the theme for this year is Going for Growth. It's a theme that the Mission and Discipleship Committee that I serve on has offered to the denomination, it's going to be a 10-year focus of sowing, growing, and reaping. And over the next couple of Sundays, we're going to explore this theme of going for growth. And today, we're going to be talking about the Great Commission and sharing our faith. Our call to worship comes from Daniel 12, chapter 3. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, 
and those who lead many to righteousness, like stars forever and ever. Father in heaven, be with us in this time of worship. Be glorified in our midst. Brood over us by your Spirit. Be in each home, with each individual and with each family. And bless our time together, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come into your presence this morning, recognizing that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the God who holds all of creation in your hands. And as we watch the effects of the rain that has fallen over the last few days, and we see the brown grass turning green, we see nature perking up, we recognize, Lord, that you have filled your creation with such abundance and such life and such vitality, and we recognize that this is just a reflection of who you are, and of your life and your vitality. And we thank you for the life that beats in our chests, for the hope that fills our hearts, and for the love that you give to each one of us. Lord, you are gracious and good, and we recognize your faithfulness, and we thank you for your love. But Father, we also need to confess that we have not always recognized your goodness and we have walked along pathways that bring death, pathways that wither our souls and dry out our hearts. 
that bring dryness and deadness to our relationships. And we want to ask for your forgiveness, Lord. Forgive us for the selfishness and the hard-heartedness, for the stubbornness and the pride that leads us to break instead of build, to neglect instead of taking notice. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to live our lives better and fuller and more beautifully because of what you did for us on the cross. And so we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your love. And we commit the rest of our service to you, Jesus. Good morning, boys and girls. It's fantastic to be with you this morning. And this morning I want to talk about a song that we sing quite often, especially in our online services. And the song talks about four different colors, and I want to talk about those colors very briefly this morning. The first color that comes up in the song is the color red. And this color reminds us of, of blood, and that's not always a nice thought. We don't like to think of bumping our noses that they bleed or cutting our fingers or maybe our foot and and it bleeds but but you know the color of red and the color of blood is a reminder of life and in the old testament they talked about the fact that life was in the blood that when somebody's blood ran out of them they couldn't live anymore and so when we talk about jesus giving his blood for us we're really saying Jesus gave his life for us. And the song talks about how Jesus gave his life for you and me. That he gave his life in place of our life so that our blood wouldn't have to flow. But that he did that for you and me. 
and that's an awesome thing. The next color that comes up in the song is the color blue. And it's about how our hearts can be cold. Because blue is the color of coldness. It's of ice and, and, and all things cold. And it's a reminder that sometimes, although we know about God's love, our hearts are cold. Cold towards God and cold towards one another. And that's one of the reasons why Jesus had to come and die. Was that our hearts were cold and without life. And he needed to give us his life. And so what he does is he covers the coldness of our hearts so that we can have life. The third color that comes up in the song is the color gold. And it talks about the gold of, of the morning sun. But the gold also talks about the life that Jesus gives to you and me. That because we believe in him, he gives us eternal life. And you might remember that Auntie Brenda talked to us about the idea that eternal life doesn't begin only one day in heaven, but that we start eternal life now, that every day can be good and beautiful because God has filled each and every day with his forgiveness, with his love, and with his promises. And that we can think about that whenever we think of what Jesus has done for us, we can say that he has made our lives golden. And so he gives us his life. The last color is the color brown. Because in the fourth verse of the song, the, the song talks about how the leaves on the tree go from green to brown, that autumn comes. And that as we live our lives, we, we get older and older every day, every week, every month and every year. And that we must make a decision to give our hearts to Jesus before it's too late. And the song says there is birth and there is death and there is a plan and there's just one God. And we must give our hearts to him before it's too late. And so these four colors, red for the blood of Jesus and the life of Jesus, blue for a reminder that our hearts can be really cold. Gold, the reminder that God gives us a good and beautiful life that begins even now. And brown reminds us that we shouldn't wait too long before we give our hearts to him. I pray that all of us will remember these colors and act on them. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you gave your life for our cold hearts and gave us a life of gold. Lord, sometimes we waste time and, and our lives start going brown. But we pray that we would always turn to you before it's too late. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
For our scripture reading this morning, we're going to be looking at the end of Matthew's Gospel, at a passage that is well known and and, uh, described as the Great Commission. Now, one of the problems with this passage is that many of us imagine this to be what Jesus said to the disciples just before he ascended into heaven. But in fact, If you read the chapter, it says that Jesus sent his disciples to Galilee and they met him on a hillside there in Galilee. But if you go to the book of Acts, we read that Jesus ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem. And so, in fact, this little speech that we have of Jesus was probably made very early in the 40 days that Jesus had between his resurrection and his ascension. Because remember, after his resurrection, he told the disciples to meet him in Galilee. And so after that initial meeting with the disciples in the upper room, they all went down to Galilee, where, amongst other things, Jesus helped them catch a whole lot of fish. And it seems that he spent some time with them in the countryside. And it seems to me that what Matthew is doing is ending his gospel on in, 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 in the context of Galilee, which is where the disciples were called. It's where Jesus began his ministry. And it seems as though Matthew is closing that loop. So this isn't, strictly speaking, the last thing that Jesus says before his ascension. But it is, maybe in some ways, the start of his teaching process over those 40 days, getting the disciples ready for the work that they were called to do. And it's being done here in Galilee on a mountain, probably overlooking the Sea of Galilee, where there were so many memories for the disciples. And remember when Jesus called them, he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And so I think this is Matthew's symmetry of recording this conversation as the way to end his gospel. But it leaves us with a very beautiful picture of Jesus and his disciples in this wilderness setting getting themselves ready for the work that will be their lifetime. And so let's listen to this passage with that picture in mind. And let's hear afresh these beautiful words that we know so well. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word passage that's so familiar to us and yet as we reflect on it today Lord we pray that our hearts would be open and that we would pay attention in a new way and respond to what you're saying to us in Jesus name Amen. I think one of the threats the church faces today is that we forget why we are here or maybe to put it another way that the Great Commission becomes the Great Omission. If one looks at the Scriptures carefully, the Church has four clear purposes. The first is to worship God, that the Church is a place of community and an agent of worship, that, that when people gather together, their eyes are drawn towards God, that God is the center of what we do. Secondly, I think the church is called to be a fellowship where people love and are loved and where they are encouraged and restored and healed and strengthened in their service. Thirdly, I believe that the church is a discipling community where people learn to follow Jesus and are equipped to follow him. And finally, I believe that the church is called to be a missional community that we see where God is at work in the world and that we join in his mission to the world. And those four things 
are our call and our function as the church. I think we're very good at the second thing of being a fellowship and being a community of people who love one another and, and encourage one another and support one another. I think we're reasonably good at number one, worshipping God and putting God at the center of things. But I think we're not always so good at number three, being a disciple in community, and number four, being a missional community, joining God with what he's doing in the world. And another way of putting this is that God gave us a great command, that is to love God and to love people. And he gave us a great commission, which was to go out into the world and make disciples. And if you look at that, that captures the four aspects of the church's work. Loving God is to worship him. Loving one another is to be the fellowship. And then the great commission is the discipleship and the joining in God's mission in the world, which includes the feeding of the sick, the clothing of the naked, the rescuing of those who are in prison, and turning our world into a better and safer place for those around us. Now this month in the Presbyterian calendar is the month of mission. And as I said at the beginning of the service, this is a month in which we focus on God's call for us to to join him in the work that he's doing in the world. And so we're coming back to our roots in this month and each Sunday we'll be looking at some aspect of what it means to be a missional church and be a church in mission. But today we come back to our roots when we consider the Great Commission. And this beautiful moment where Jesus, after his resurrection, gathers his disciples together and says, Right, this is where we're going. This is what we're going to be doing. And for the 40 days that he has between resurrection and ascension, Jesus is urging, encouraging his disciples to be the ones who will go out and make a difference in the world. And I quite like the idea that in Matthew we see how those 40 days started, and in Acts chapter 1 we see how those 40 days ended. I really like the symmetry that we have if Matthew gives us the, the beginning of the 40 days, uh, all authority has been given, go and make disciples, and Luke ends those 40 days with Jesus saying, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And that really gives us the full spectrum of, of what the post-resurrection time was all about. But let's dig into the Great Commission a little bit more carefully. And I want to start on a note of comfort, because for us, any, any message on the Great Commission always feels a little bit daunting, because deep down we all know that this is an area that we need to do some work on. Did you notice how it starts, where the disciples gather on the mountain as Jesus asked them to? And what did they do? They worshipped him. And so we see that first function of the church being fulfilled, that they worshipped him. And then Matthew says, but some doubted. And he uses the word distazwa, which only gets used one other time in the New Testament. And interesting enough, it's Matthew who uses that word. And he uses it when Peter is walking on the water and he suddenly looks at the wind and the waves and he starts sinking and Jesus catches him by the hand and says, but why did you doubt? And it's a beautiful picture for me because those who are there on this mountainside had seen Jesus risen from the dead. I can't imagine anything more amazing than that. And yet they doubted. And that leaves plenty of room for people like you and me. Because if those original eyewitnesses could doubt, then so can you and I. And the comforting thing is that by having Matthew reuse this word in this way, we're reminded that when we doubt, Jesus has us by the hand. That he will journey with us through our doubts and our fears and give us the strength to overcome our doubts and our fears. And so when we doubt, we know 
that Jesus will grab our hands and carry us through this time. But let's move on to verses 18, 19 and 20. And in these verses we find four verbs. And they're important verbs. Go, make disciples, baptize and teach. The first of those verbs, go, is a passive participle which means that it sketches the background. And for a long time, people have preached on, on, on Matthew 28, and they've put massive emphasis on the word go. You know, go to Uzbekistan, go to Timbuktu, go to the other side of the world, go to the other side of town. But that's not really what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is, as you go, wherever you go, whenever you go, However you go. This word go in the passive participle really is saying that whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, whenever it might be, make disciples. This word is saying that our evangelism, our outreach, our reaching people needs to be something that we do while we're doing everything else. While we're working, while we're with our families. While we're with our friends, we need to be making disciples. And that's the next verb, is this verb for making disciples. And this is the only imperative verb in the passage. This is the central verb. This is what it's all about. And Jesus doesn't call us to make converts. He calls us to make disciples. He calls us to to help people to become followers of Jesus. Now, in, in, in the days of multimedia, a follower has started to become something different from what it was back then. When you follow somebody on social media, it just means that you look at what they're doing. But back in Jesus' time, a follower was someone who was a tracker or a student of Jesus. I'm told that at one point when they were translating the Bible into one of the Bushman dialects, they were looking for a word for disciple and decided to use the word tracker. That when I'm a disciple of Jesus, when I'm following Jesus, I'm tracking him. And if you think of what's involved in being a tracker, it means to follow closely, to walk in the footsteps of, to, to go the way of Jesus. And this is what you and I are encouraged to do, is to help people to become a follower of Jesus. And I want to take a moment here to say then that one of the most important things that, or one of the most important areas of discipleship is that of a parent and a child. That we as parents are equipped in a phenomenal way to be able to help our children become followers of Jesus, that by our words and by our example, by the life habits that we live and create, our children can learn how to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, and that this is a task that you and I have, that we need to help people to become more and more like Jesus. And Paul boldly says to his readers, Follow me as I follow Christ. And that really is the best way for us to make disciples. There are two other verbs in this passage. The next one is the, word, is the verb baptize, and the other is the verb teaching. Both of them are participles. And that really means that, that they are telling us how to do the, 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 the key verb. And the key verb is make disciples. How do we make disciples? Well, by baptizing them and by teaching them. That's the role that these two verbs play. They are how-to verbs. And in baptism, we see that baptism represents a symbol of making a public stand. It represents being immersed in Christ. It's indicative of the work that God does in us. And it's a sign of cleansing and renewal. It started with the baptism of those who were converts to Christianity, who came to Christianity for the first time. But it also began to include those who were born 
into the family of faith and were baptized as infants and then later in life would make their own public stand for the gospel. And both of these are present in the early church. Firstly, the, ideas of the, the idea of those coming to Christ for the first time, taking that public stand. But then secondly, when those believers had children, that their children were included in the household of faith. And so you have the Philippian jailer being baptized with the whole of his family because they believed that God was at work in their family and that God loved us long before we loved him. And so we baptize our children because he loves them even before they love him. And, and baptism is completed when they take their public stand. But baptism represents this idea of being immersed in Christ, cleansed by Christ, made new by Christ, being given a new life in Christ and making a public stand for Christ. But the second how lies in the teaching. And we teach people not just head knowledge, but we teach them to obey, to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, that we teach them a life and not just a set of ideas. This is not only head knowledge, but heart knowledge and life knowledge, that we teach people to be followers of Jesus in their heads, in their hearts and in their hands, and that they learn to serve and follow Christ in all that they do. This is our task. This is what Jesus calls us to do. This is at the heart of what it means to be the church. If we look at the four purpose of the purposes of the church, making disciples and, and joining in the mission of God in the world are two out of the four priorities that we have as the church. Once we have worshipped God and loved one another, we need to teach the world, reach the world, to be disciples of Christ. But before Matthew concludes with his gospel, we have yet another comfort. Because as Jesus talks to the disciples about the task that he has called them to do, he offers them yet another comfort. He says, and surely I'll be with you, even to the end of the age. We will not be doing this work by ourselves. We will be accompanied by the presence of Christ, that through his Holy Spirit, he will be with us. And the one who has all authority on heaven and on earth, because he died and rose from the dead, because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and the one who sends us his Spirit, he will be with us. We will never be alone. And in fact, God never sends us somewhere that he is not already at work. Surely, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. So let me conclude. There is a great danger that we omit the work of sharing our faith from our task of being followers of Christ. There is a great danger that for us church becomes something that comforts us and meets our needs and does what we want and gives us the comfort and peace that we need and that we become inward looking instead of focused outward. There is a great danger that we can forget what Jesus did for us. There is a great danger that we make it too complicated, that we think that going in, implies that we have to be trained and learn a foreign language and go to a foreign, foreign land, when in fact Jesus is simply saying, in your day-to-day -day life, be ready to share your faith. There is a danger that we don't see people as valuable. There is a danger that we succumb to our doubts and to our fears. And so Jesus calls his disciples there in Galilee, bringing them back to their first calling, their first encounter. He says, go, go and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit and teach them to obey all I have commanded you. And remember, I'll be with you to the end of the age. And I pray that we will do just that. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. While we can't take up a physical offering, we can still respond to God's word and goodness by offering ourselves. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your everlasting love and mercy on us. We come to your throne with humble hearts as we are so thankful for the daily blessings you bestow on us. We offer you our time, treasures and talents and pray that you use them for your glory and for the expansion of your kingdom. All we have is yours, Father, and we ask that you would use us and all we have as you will. May your gifts bring shelter to the homeless, comfort to the sick, rest to the weary, and hope to the hopeless. We love you, Lord. Amen. As we come to the table, we remember that red is the color of the blood that flowed down the face of someone who loved us so. And just as the shadow of the cross falls onto this piece of paper as I hold it in front of you, so as we eat and drink together, the shadow of the cross falls over you and me. And we remember that we are forgiven because of what Christ did for us on the cross. So Paul writes to the church in Corinth and says, I received from the Lord the tradition that I handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. After supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. And so we do this in word and in action until Jesus comes again. And so let's follow his example and join together in prayer. Father God in heaven, as we gather together, we remember that you gave your one and only Son. Lord Jesus, that you would come and lay down your life for us, and by the power of the Spirit, you would resist temptation, that you would retain your holiness and majesty, and lay your life down for us. Lord, we're amazed and grateful and filled with awe and wonder. And so, with all of your angels, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying together, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory be to you, O Lord Most High. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, not as we ought, but really only as we are able, do we give you thanks for your body broken for us and your blood shed for us. And we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to sanctify us and these gifts of bread and wine, not only on this table, but in every home where this church service is being watched. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that the bread that we break would be to us the communion of the body of Christ, the cup that we bless may it be to us the communion of the blood of Christ, that as we eat and drink, we may be partakers of your body and blood to our spiritual benefit and our growth in grace for the glory of your name. And Lord, we offer to you ourselves living sacrifices, wanting to be holy and pleasing in your service. 
and we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so according to the example and command of our Lord Jesus, and in remembrance of him, we do this, that on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you are the Redeemer of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, as you take away the sins of the world, grant us your peace. I invite you now in your homes to take the bread, break it and distribute it amongst yourselves, saying, this is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. Eat in remembrance of him. Christ's body for me. And then take the cup and drink, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you. Jesus' blood was shed for me. Let's try together as we pray. Almighty God, we come into your presence this morning, thanking you for the gift of your Son, thanking you that you rose from the dead, that you set us free from our doubts and our fears, that you entrust your reputation into our hands and give us the work of making disciples. Lord, we're not worthy of your love and we're not worthy of sharing in your work, and yet you do this for us. And we thank you for the good news of the gospel, for the privilege of sharing your love with the world, for the blessings that you surround us with. And Lord, forgive us for the times that our, our blessings have distracted us, but help us always to reflect your love to those that we encounter. And Lord, we would pray for our world, for our country, for our young people, we pray, Father, that you would continue to be with us as the grip of the coronavirus continues. We thank you that we've been able to move down to level one, but we do still hear of people being infected. We do still hear of many who are struggling in this time. We lift to you those that are not well, those who are struggling. We pray for our country as we lead up to elections, and we pray for wisdom for our leaders. We pray for the church, Lord. Help us to stay true to our mission. Help us to share your love and light with the world. Help us to shine like stars with the good news of your message. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
It's been really lovely to be with you this morning. And I do pray that you will experience God's presence and God's love in the week that lies ahead. And uh, that you will remember that we are called. Called to make disciples. Keep your eyes open for every opportunity. Remember what Peter writes when he says, Always be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. And so share God's love whenever he gives you the opportunity. Share what God has done for you. Share the love of Christ whenever you can. Through words, but also through your actions. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us, now and forevermore. Amen. Here are the birthdays for Emmanuel and Grace. On Sunday the 3rd, we have Renee, Felicia and Pierre. On Monday is Liam. Tuesday the 5th is Liz. Wednesday the 6th is Kambar. On Thursday the 7th, Danielle turns 7. And it's Masanda's birthday. On Saturday the 9th, Kayla turns 20. Our anniversaries for the week on Sunday, Claudia and Donald have been married for 34 years. On Tuesday, Susan and Peter, 19 years. Also on Tuesday, Denise and Harold, 48 years. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love and faithfulness to each person celebrating their birthday or anniversary this week. Please guide them, strengthen them, and help them to grow in wisdom as they walk.